it's what I imagine a cloud would feel like. It's soft as um, eagle down. Special animals that only chiefs and their hunters were permitted to take. They were very prized in terms of uh, the, the pelt. Only hot wear or people of high standing were ever, ever, ever had them. The sea otter in our language is called Quat Quat. We say Quat Quat. Try not to ask me how to spell it. <laughs> the, the sea otter, is, um, we call it Kuru. I believe that sea, the sea otter has a place in our environment. They play a role where kelp forests are growing. Um, we know that without the sea otter, uh, kelp forests would be overtaken by sea urchins. Uh, we have to learn how to maintain that balance. The relationships between people, kelp forests and sea otters have literally spanned millennia. And there are actually governance practices in place that manage these relationships. But the fur trade, it changed all that. Not only did it cause the elimination of sea otters, it caused the increase in their prey. Shellfish, sea urchins, abalone, clams and cockles, crabs. All of those prey became increasingly more available and we became increasingly more reliant on them. Not only for food, food to feed our families, but for jobs, for our livelihoods. And so with the return of sea otters now, and the decline in some of those same shellfish prey that we love to eat, that we depend on for you know, economic value, for cultural value, that's caused a real conflict. The return of the sea otter certainly raises the kinds of issues that require people to think really carefully about how they manage local ocean spaces around them and whether or not they want to have shellfish uh, because we know that the return of the sea otters will reduce the amount of shellfish that is available and beginning to ask these questions in another way saying well wait a minute what do we really want here and that sounds like it will call for and certainly uh, benefit from the reassertion of territorial rights on the part of the the first nations groups in this area traditionally uh, we had people who were responsible for taking care of the resources and when the sea otter was abundant in our territory, uh, this family would be uh, charged with protecting our clam beaches, our, um, our crab uh, harvesting areas. The old days on Haida Gwaii, sea otter were uh, hunted in, uh, by, by chiefs and their, and their hunters in their own territories. The uh, men used ceremony before they went out and then they would use small, small canoes that would go through the kelp easily and they would use spears or clubs. The sea otters were used as um, dress for the, um, they were called lana auga our, our um, head chiefs, and they would be also used as wall covering in, during the winters to keep, to keep the people inside the house warm, and they would be used as um, bedding. We looked at um, the dietary specialization in otters archaeologically from four, four areas of the north coast and saw that there was a very narrow dietary niche that they were um, these otters were occupying and, and that suggests that people were holding the populations down below their maximum carrying capacity and so that 
we claim suggests that people were deliberately keeping otters out of certain areas to maintain access to certain shellfish resources. That's consistent with a whole range of um, observations that First Nations today have about how they dealt with otters. My grandfather used to say that to deter the sea otters from coming onto the beach, they would kill a couple of them and anchor them out in front of the beach so that the sea otters that were coming in would see their cousins had been uh, killed. And uh, we used that as a deterrent. I deal with a, a complex group of people, some of whom are otter lovers and they don't want to see an otter hurt no matter what and other people are deeply connected to shell fisheries and I respect a lot of these people but their views are so radically different that uh, you know my view is actually somewhere in between. Sea otters eat shellfish um, and because they eat urchins, urchins eat kelp. If you're an organism that depends on kelp that's a good thing. If, however, you're a human being who harvests sea urchins or harvests gooey ducks or wants to dig clams in the intertidal, you're going to compete with an otter. So your perception of what an otter is doing might not be quite as good as, as someone who enjoys seeing kelp. So it's not a matter of good or bad. They just they, they have an essential role in that ecosystem. There's so many of these indirect effects that um that propagate through the system that we're learning, to, you know, it's very important to societies in general that sea otters and other large predators um, recover in systems because they were performing really important roles, as were humans. I mean, I would include in that important large predators, I'd include human beings, and clearly in this ecosystem, they were performing really important functions. It's got to be seen that that human beings are a part of the environment, um, a part of the ecology, a part of the balance, and, uh, and it should work. You know, and I think a lot of people don't ever dig clams or ever kill their supper, and uh, to them it's a, you know, it's a different world than what we live in. Isak, which is respect for self, others, all living things, and inanimate things. Those are the, the pillars of governance. I talked about the governance toolbox, it's called a hoopakuna. And in there was everything that the chief needed to govern his nation. What did that include? Well, it included a kuhman, a kuhia, a carving that really is for permission granting to harvest whatever resource. If getting a protected area means that our people are locked out of it, then really there's no advantage and it's, and, it's, and it's not a good thing for our people. You know, not the natural world that needs to be managed, it's the people who need to be managed. I think it's important that uh, we combine traditional knowledge and uh, scientific knowledge, um, both uh, accommodate one another and I believe that's useful. These territorial use rights that happened in the past could be used again today to try and solve some of these conflicts and some of these trade-offs. I see the otter issue come up again and again as it is now being just a shell fisheries conflict problem. It's not just a shell fisheries conflict problem. It is a problem that involves a lot of indirect effects. These are the biggest ecosystems we have and one can make a plausible, believable argument that one can find trophic cascades there. But one has to look and, and, and think about this as a dynamic world. And if you ignore or dismiss the dynamics, we'll be back in the dark ages, scientifically in terms of understanding.